How about that heat wave? 47 this morning. I'm sweating. You know it's bad when the temperature outside isn't high enough to vote. It's a rough, rough, because it's below 18. That's, that's what that means. Man, it was cold. It was snowy. And in case you missed it, that's what was going on. And, and I, I, you might be one of those people that was like, you're like batting down the hatches, prepared, like hyper-prepared person. You're like, yeah, I'm going to do everything right. And then you could be like Grant, who just goes to Austin with the clothes on his back, right? And he's like, I'm just going to ride into town and I'm going to make do with what I got. I don't care how prepared you were or how unprepared you were. I don't think anybody was completely prepared for what took place this past week. It was a wild week. I hope, uh, as Grant said and as we've expressed, like I hope that things have kind of moved back uh, to a semblance of normalcy for you. If you're still uh, struggling, having some, some problems, maybe you missed work this week and you don't have resources uh, to maybe get groceries, please let us know. We want to help uh, and we want to be available to do that. So please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, and you can come see me in Next Steps or whatever and we'll get you set up uh, with what you need. But preparation is key. It's an important part of our lives. We like to be prepared and sometimes we like to be a little too prepared, right? Right? Uh, I think that's one of the things when, when we talk about blessing other people, and that's what we're, we're doing. We're in this series right now called BLESS, and we're walking through an acronym uh, describing how we might engage other people for the gospel and really be a blessing in their lives. And so the first uh, letter is B, before anything else, pray. We're going to be talking about that today. Uh, then the second one is listen. The L is listen. Very important to do. It's one I struggle with, just to listen to what people are saying. And then the E is eat. Uh, that doesn't have to just be eating with somebody. It can be sharing an activity, doing something shoulder to shoulder to, to just get to, to know them and spending time with them. And then the uh, first S is serve, uh, doing, meeting their needs, uh, being observant to what they might have going on in their life and then working uh, to meet those needs. And then lastly, sharing, sharing what God is doing in your life, sharing your story, uh, sharing with them what maybe God is doing in their life. And those are those letters. So today we're talking about uh, before anything else, pray. And I think when we go to be a blessing in people's lives, preparation for us uh, is something that we really highly prize. We're like, I can't share my faith. I can't talk to anybody about Jesus. I can't share my story with other people. I'm not ready yet. I've got to read like six books on apologetics. I've got to forget three of the books that I read. And then I got to do this and this, and then I might be ready we do a lot of preparation. And what I want us to do today is I want us to talk about this concept of before anything else, pray. And what I, what I want us to think about is not just time-wise before anything else. So before I engage this person, I'm going to pray. Think of it in priority. Before Prayer comes before anything else. It's the highest priority. It's the highest work we do. If the only thing you do is pray for other people, you are doing a huge work. And I promise you, God will lead you into the other uh, steps of this process if you begin to pray for other people. So today I want us to talk about what it is that we're actually doing when we pray. Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 17, verses 20 to 26. As you, so you can open your Bible there, and we're going to be looking at three simple questions. Who do I pray for? What do I pray for them? And then why is it that I need to pray? So let's talk about who we pray for. Who do I pray for? Uh, these last few verses of John chapter 17, this is a part of a larger dialogue, really prayer, that Jesus is teaching, he's engaging his disciples, talking about like the Holy Spirit and all this other stuff is going on. And then at the end, he's praying for them. And this is called the high priestly prayer. He's praying for them that they would, that would, uh, they would be encouraged, would be strengthened, the Spirit would come and dwell with them. And then from verses 20 to 26, he's praying for a very special group of people. It's a group of people that doesn't exist yet all those who would hear from the disciples. Verse 20, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus' prayer uh, here, I find really interesting because if I'm in the situation he's in, which is about to die, and he knows he's about to die. He's going to the cross tomorrow morning. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be ridiculed. I'm sorry, but I'm going to be like, hey, guys, great meal. I didn't eat very much because I'm nervous. I'm, I'm just going to go and have some time to pray for myself. And he does this at the Garden of Gethsemane. He does this later, but I'd be pretty self-focused. The other thing that I would think about is I would think about the people that were in the room with me. 
Like, man, the disciples, the, the followers, they're going to have a really hard time. And again, Jesus knows the future. He knows that these men uh, and women are going to suffer. They're going to hurt. Many are going to be put to death because of him. And so I'd be spending a lot of time praying for them. And he does. He spends a lot of time. But the people, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about like the future generations coming after us. This is what's so amazing about Jesus. He thinks about the people who are going to believe and he begins to pray for us, for you and for me. He's praying for you and for me here. If you don't think that Jesus thinks about you, guess what? He did, and he still is. So he's praying for us. He's praying for those who believe. And so this gives us an idea of who we should be praying for. And we really should be looking out for two uh, kinds of people, two characteristics of the people we're looking for. Now, if you're like me, uh, I, because I'm a hardback copy kind of person, we didn't have church last week, I didn't grab a copy of, of the Bless uh, Guide yet. But, uh, so I didn't pick my four people. So last week we were supposed to pick our four people, I just didn't get to it this week. And if that, you haven't yet, that's okay. So this is good, we're gonna talk about who we might be looking for for our four people this morning. It's a good, good thing. And then we're gonna talk about how we can pray for them. So two characteristics for these people. One, uh, they're gonna be told about Jesus by the disciples. Again, look what's said. I do not ask for these only, but also those who will believe in me. Jesus operates under the assumption that there's a group of people and there will probably uh, exist a group of people throughout history that don't yet know about Jesus and know who he is. And this is a concept that gets repeated again and again in scripture. The idea of God's people going and telling people that don't know about what God's doing. Moses is told by God at the burning bush, go and tell Pharaoh that things are about to get real rough. And then it, 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 uh, God appears to Nathan, the prophet, in 2 Samuel. He says, go and tell David that I'm going to make an agreement between him and me. I'm going to make a promise with him. And then Jeremiah is told to go and tell. There's this prophet. Uh, his name starts with an H. It's really complicated. Uh, this prophet is going to, to say all these wrong things. He's going to say, oh, there's no exile. There's, it's all going to be fine. It's going to be working out okay. And God says, Jeremiah, go and tell him he's wrong. Set him straight. Jonah is told to go and tell Nineveh that they need to repent or be destroyed. And then John the Baptist's disciples, after John the Baptist is arrested in the book of Matthew, they go to Jesus and say, hey, are you like the guy that we should be looking for or are we looking for another Messiah? And Jesus says, go back and tell John what you're seeing and let him make the decision based on that. So when we pray, we need to be thinking about who it is that we are going to tell. Basically, who is within earshot of us? Now, back in the day, earshot was like your immediate circle, your family, your friends, maybe your neighborhood, your village, your city. Our reach goes much further than that. There's all these apps and social media and things like that where your voice is heard by a lot of different people. People that in, in previous years you would have never uh, spoken with after you leave high school, we now keep up with them for some reason. I don't know. I guess it's the Lord being like, you, need to, you didn't share with them in high school. I'm giving you another chance. You're going to bless their life now uh, in between pictures of your cats. Um, this, is, this is what we do. And so we have all these opportunities to proclaim the gospel of God to all these people. And our, our voice goes further. We live in maybe the most democratic age in history where every voice really has a lot of weight because of the different media outlets that we have. We need to be praying for who can hear our voice and looking for people that were, are within earshot. Secondly, Jesus is praying that there will be people who will be one with him. Verse 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you've sent me. This is an amazing prayer. It's a ridiculous prayer. If Jesus didn't pray it, I'd be like, Psh. He is praying that human beings that are sinful people who have done wrong things, have a sinful condition, would experience the same unity with God, the Father, that the Son experiences. The Son is perfect. The idea that I could have that kind of a relationship with the Father, frankly, to me, is ridiculous. And again, if Jesus didn't pray it, I wouldn't believe it. But apparently it's something open to us. Now, when I say oneness with the Father, I'm not talking about that our identity gets subsumed into like this greater Godhood and we become sort of, pan that's not what's going on. The Father and the Son are distinct persons, both God, co-equal, but they're distinct persons. The Son does not lose his identity in the Father or vice versa. So there's a different kind of unity that's being described here. 
And it really helps us to identify who might be people that we should pray for. Unity, as described here, is unity of purpose and the unity of love. Now, I want you to think about the relationship of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's unity of purpose. The Trinity's goal, it's per, his purpose, their purpose, his purpose, is to bring glory to God, to glorify himself. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all working together to make the name of God great. That is unity of purpose. And that is our purpose as created beings. As created beings, our purpose in life is to make God's name great. To make God's name great through our lives, through our talents, through our abilities. And this is the people we need to look for when we begin to pray. Who is not doing this? Now, again, you can look at your own life and be like, I see all sorts of ways I'm not doing this. But who is finding their purpose, their identity, their goal in something, maybe even that's good, but it's become the ultimate thing. It's consumed somebody and they're looking for their purpose in that. We have to be careful of that. We have to look for that because I, uh, I, I have a tendency to find my purpose in things that are not giving God glory. The second thing he talks about here is this unity of, uh, of love, right? Unity of love. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they love one another. It's an unconditional love. It's a love that's boundless. It's a love that favors the other. And Jesus is praying here that we would feel that same love from God, this unconditional, boundless sort of love from God. And there are people in our world that do not feel that love. There are people in this room watching online that do not feel love that love. And so to pray that God would open our eyes and we would look for people that don't feel that kind of love. So what does this look like practically? What if, what is somebody that's not unity of purpose, unity of love, what does this look like? Well, unity of purpose, find people in your life like climbing the corporate ladder. Nothing wrong with that as long as it's not your ultimate goal in life. If you find your value and your purpose in promotion, it's not great. Now, if you're doing that so that you might be a blessing to other people in some way, shape, or form because of what God's called you to do, that's different. People uh, also miss out on the unity of love. And it can look like different things. It can look like, on some level, it can look like people who are dejected, seem lonely. Sure, that can be people that miss out on love. But there's other people that, that, that act like they don't know God's love in other ways. Do you ever feel like you're constantly trying to prove yourself? Constantly got to make people like me. If I don't have other people's approval, then I'm missing out on something. Guess what? You are not feeling the love of God in your life. And so we need to look for people. Those can be the people that we, we recognize, like, God, they, they need the love of the Lord in their life. They need to, to find their purpose in him, and we can reach out to them. So we need to ask God to open our eyes to these people, and then we begin to pray for them. Now, if you're like me, I, I want to pray more for people. I do. Uh, one of the problems that I have in that is not just identifying the people, but also recognizing what do I need to pray for them? Like, what, what is it that I'm supposed to say? And so the second thing I want to talk about today is who, what is the content of our prayer? What do we actually pray? And Jesus gives us some ideas right here. The first is that they might recognize their situation. Look at verse 22. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. So if there's a group of people that are one with God, those who are followers of Jesus Christ, who've trusted in his death, his burial, and resurrection, then that means there's a group of people that aren't experiencing this. And so one of the things that you can pray for other people, especially if you're not aware of their spiritual situation, is that they would recognize their own spiritual state, that they would become aware of the fact that they are not one with the Father, if that is in fact the case in their life that they would not experience the joy, the comfort, the excitement of the pursuits in their life if those pursuits are the chief thing about their life. Now, it sounds like what I'm asking us to do is to pray that people would be miserable. That's not what I'm saying. I want people to be happy. Okay, we're hearing this? But what I don't want people to do are to find their ultimate happiness in things that are not ultimately good. There are a lot of good things. There are not a lot of ultimately good. Good, thanks. Does that make sense? 
I want people to see that the pursuit of their career or the pursuit of having the perfect family or the pursuit of, of marriage or whatever it is, is not going to make them happy. And I want them to see it for what it really is. And I want them to feel that. People need to experience that before they can recognize, before they can, they can come to the love of the Father. We need to be careful about how we pray that prayer but we still need to pray it as well. And so when we pray that they would recognize their situation, we also need to pray that they would believe that Jesus is from God. Look back again at the passage. I and them, you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me. Oftentimes we get consumed by our own pursuits, right? We get consumed by the things that we're we're trying to do and we get distracted from what Jesus is doing. But notice in 1723, we want people to know that Jesus is from God, that he's been sent by the Father to rescue and redeem us. I think most people want to know and believe that God loves them. I think most people sort of had this concept of like, yeah, God's probably on my side, right? If he, if he wasn't or some way, shape or form, he'd probably like snuff me out, right? Just, just that'd be the end of it. What I think people don't realize is, yes, I think many of us, I think everybody in some way, shape or form, because of providence, feel the love of God in some way in their life. But Jesus Christ is the ultimate expression of God's love. The fact that he sends his own son to die for you and for me, that we might be brought into a relationship with him, to not feel the love of God or or to, to not believe in Christ is to cut off from yourself the chief and greatest form of God's love in your life. And there are people that do this. They're like, yeah, God loves me, but you're not even feeling like the greatest way that God loves you. You feel like a gentle breeze when you could have like air conditioning, right? Now I recognize air conditioning is like the worst analogy ever from this week, but it's what I got. You are missing out on something. And there are people who are missing out on the love of Christ. So we must pray that they would feel the love of God, that they would feel, they would recognize that Jesus comes from the Father. And that leads us to The third thing we can pray for them, that they would feel the love of God in Christ. That they would feel the love of God in Christ. Look back again at verse 23. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. If you don't know what to pray for somebody or you only have time to offer up a short prayer, asking that somebody would feel the love of God in Christ is maybe the best prayer you can offer. If you wanna pray one thing for me for this week, I would love that. Feel the love of God in Christ. Paul prays for this. John speaks of it. And what's really cool about it is it's something that's brought up a lot in the Bible. And you know where it shows up the most? It shows up in the Old Testament, which I think for many people would seem strange because our perception of the Old Testament is that it's all like fire and brimstone and judgment and God seems angry, which is not true, but that's the perception we have of it. There's this word, or phrase rather, in the Old Testament. It's called steadfast love. And you see it often. And it's actually one Hebrew word called hesed. And when the the psalmist or somebody prays like, God, I want to experience your steadfast love. May I feel your steadfast love. May your steadfast love shine upon me. Something like that. Uh, They're saying that that I want your hesed. And it's a technical term for God's covenantal love. So what they're appealing to is that God would love them based on the agreements that he's made with his people. And God makes agreements, they're called covenants, with his people. He made one with Noah, he made one with Adam, he made one with Moses, with with David. We talked about that a little bit. And he's made one with us in Jesus Christ. It's called the new covenant. So when you go to, to God and you say, Lord, I want you to feel, I want to feel your steadfast love, it's this idea that you will love me based on your agreements that you've made. You've promised to love me, so please love me. And God's like, you're absolutely right. I've promised to love you and I will because I don't break my promises. So it's not love me because you feel like it. Love me because you got a warm fuzzy. No, no, no. It's way better than that. God has committed himself to us. And when you get to the new covenant in Christ, which is formed in his blood, when Jesus dies, he starts a new agreement with me and with you for those who believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. And if you haven't done that, you can do that today. You can talk to somebody about it. But he starts a new agreement. And some of the things that we get from that are eternal life. A resurrected body after our death when Christ returns. The Holy Spirit living inside of us. A fellowship of brothers and sisters. 
that we're not related to biologically, but we're related to spiritually and a whole bunch of other stuff. And so when we begin to pray that, that people would feel the love of God in Christ, when you pray that for another person, what you're asking them is to, God, let them enjoy the blessings of the new covenant. This new agreement that you started in your son, let them feel that. And that means that if somebody doesn't know Christ, you're praying that they would come to know him because that's how you get to experience the joys of the blessings of the new covenant. If you're praying that for somebody who is a believer, guess what? You're asking them to get the joy of fellowship, that the spirit of God would guide them, that they would be forgiven. It's a great prayer. May they feel the love of God in Christ. You're asking for new covenant blessing in their life. It's a beautiful thing to pray. And it's based on scripture. And there's one other thing that we can pray in relation to other people. And this is a little more self-focused. It's also focused on other people who God might be using in their life. And it's that we might do what we can to bless their life. That we might do what we can to bring them close to Christ. Look at verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you've given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you've given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. I'm gonna go through this a little quickly. There's two ideas here that Jesus is talking about. He's talking about uh, that, that, that people would be with him. And then he's also talking about his glory, okay? So let's talk about people being with him. One of the things we focus on at Christmas time is the Son of God comes to be with us, right? Puts on flesh, he dwells amongst men. Great idea, love Christmas, good stuff. But then Jesus here is praying that they, that's us, would be with him. So there's two sister concepts, Jesus, the Son of God coming to be with us, but then us also going to be with him. And these things work in tandem. I think one of the things we are awesome at at Park Cities, and I mean this, is going and being with people. We get out, I mean, you saw just pictures of it. We get out and we go and meet people where they are. We go to Vickery, we go to Jack Lowe, we go to, we go to South Dallas, we go to Cornerstone, we go to South Texas, we go overseas when there wasn't a pandemic. We do all this stuff and it's awesome. Great job, high five. It's called incarnation, incarnational ministry. We learn it from Jesus. One of the things I don't think we do as good of a job of, if I can be a little prophetic here for a second, is I don't think we do a good job of inviting people into where we are. We go back to our homes, we go back to our neighborhoods, we go back to our comfort zones, and we like, Shook. this is my space, this is where I live. I will come back out of my shell later, but I'll stay in my shell for right now. I'm guilty of this, straight up. It's my safe space. So Jesus, if we're following him, one of the things we can pray is that God, you would move us out and that you would help us to be more hospitable than we've ever been before in our life. Now, right now, pandemic, blizzard, probably whatever happens next week is gonna make that a little difficult, I get it. Next week, everybody's doors will fall off or whatever. Who knows? What we need to do is over this, the, the, as we're ramping up maybe to coming back to being able to have people more in our homes and stuff like that, praying that God would give us a hospitable heart. And the second thing he talks about is his glory. Now, the glory that Jesus is talking about here is his eternal glory. The glory that the disciples see on the Mount of Transfiguration. The glory that he's had from eternity past and he'll always have. But there's another kind of glory that Jesus uh, has. And it's one we don't like to talk about as much because it makes us uncomfortable. It's the glory of suffering. We don't like to think about this, but the cross is glorious. It's brutal, but it's beautiful. And Jesus invites us because the servant, us, is not better than the master, him. He invites us into sharing into the glory, both of his glory that he has, his glorious glory. that that He's like, yeah, come and share in that. I want to invite you and be where I am. But he also invites us to share in his glory suffering kind of glory. And it is hard being in the lives of other people. And one of the things that I find most difficult about being a blessing in the lives of other people is being consistent. Sometimes when people get hard, I'm just like, okay, I'm gonna back away slowly, let you self-destruct, and I'll come and clean up the pieces later. We have a tendency to do that, right? Use those words like boundaries. Boundaries are good, helpful, I get it. But sometimes we use boundaries as an excuse just to be like, meh, you're a little much right now. Let you figure yourself out. We need to be willing to suffer for other people because that's the kind of glory that Jesus has. So as we land the plane, I want us to think about reasons why we need to pray. We've talked about a lot of reasons why to pray, but I want to focus on two. Why do we pray? And it really focuses around two ideas. It's too big of a job and it takes too long. Too big of a job and it takes too long. Verse 25, O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. 
And these know that you have sent me. Notice he says the world, right? The world. That's our mission field. That's the, the group of people that we're really, as the church, capital C church as a whole, we're trying to bless the world, right? That's a big, big group. In Matthew 28, we're given our, our sort of the great commission, right? It's go and make disciples of who? All nations. The word for nations there is ethnos. It's a Greek word, and it's where we get words like ethnicity from. So when we think of nations, we think of like political entities like France, Germany, Japan, Mexico, Trinidad and Tobago. I can keep going. We think of all these different nations. But in the New Testament era, it wasn't just like political entities. Ethnicity, as we know today, is, is like, a, like a common culture, common language, common set of customs and beliefs. And so when you use that, that uh, measuring stick for a, a group of people, your workplace has its own customs, has its own culture. That's a nation. You can make disciples there. Your family, bless its sweet little heart, has its own weird customs, its own weird culture. And mine does too. And that's a nation. That's a group of people that you can make disciples in. And so when you begin to use this definition, sorry, I picked on your family. Your family's super cool. When you use this definition of nations, you realize how big the task is. We are supposed to make disciples from every kind of conceivable group of people you can possibly think of. And that's huge. And so we need to pray. It's too big. I can't do it. God has to do it. And he's gonna do it through us. Yes, he wants to use us. But it's too big just for us. So we need to pray. It's also gonna to take too long. Look at verse 26. Verse 26 says, I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you've loved me may be in them and I in them. Look, Jesus, the way he continues to make it known is through us. He leaves, he's gonna come back, but he makes it known through us. This idea of continuing to make it known is going on and on and on. I don't know about you, but I go through phases where like I'm into something and then I like fall out of it and then I'm like passionate about it again. Uh, so uh, for a while I was into English Premier League soccer and then I had kids and I was like, I just don't have time on a Saturday morning to watch this anymore. And then my wife and I watched a documentary on Amazon Prime about a Premier League club and I'm like super back in, baby. Like I'm totally in. It sucked me back in, darn it. I go through things like that in my spiritual life as well. And sometimes I think that's the Lord working, raising us a bit of awareness of like things that we need to work on in our life. But I find when it comes to blessing other people, sometimes I'll be really passionate about it and really outwardly focused. And then something will happen and I'm like right back in to, to like self-focus. And so we need to pray that God would make us consistent. Give me that passion. Keep me going. Keep me going. So today, what we've talked about is who we need to pray for. People that are missing out on finding their purpose in the Lord, people that are missing out on feeling the love of God. Those are the people we need to keep an eye out for. They could be in our homes, they could be anywhere. And then what do we pray for them? That they would find the things that they find ultimately valuable not to be as valuable as they think. That they would feel that disconnect. And they'd see that God has sent his son so they might be reconciled and that they might feel the love of God in Christ. And we pray for each other and pray for ourselves that we'll continue to be a consistent witness because this is a huge process, it's a huge task. And so we have to pray. We have to pray. It's too big. It's going to take too long. And so one of the things I want us to do as we close out today, as we, we finish up our time uh, this morning, which is so good to see you guys uh, this morning, is I'm going to invite Han uh, O oh, to be up here with us as well. Han is uh, just a great, a great faithful person of prayer. And one of the reasons why I want him uh, to share with us this morning and lead us in a time of prayer uh, is because Han... Uh, uh, told me that he's, he's actually laid out specifically how he's going uh, to do that this week. And so I want him to share with us how he's going to do it and provide an example and then give us time uh, for us to pray. So Han, if you could walk us through this, that'd be great. Well, thanks, Travis. Um, yeah, I mean, what Travis told, talked about today was essentially the, the who, the what, and the why. And what I want to do today uh, as we close our time together is really talk about the how. Church, I believe that prayer is posture, and uh, our praying, our going before the Lord, it communicates our dependence on the Lord, it, depends, uh, it communicates our love for Him, as well as our humi humility. Um, so here's what I want to do, church. I want to pray together as a church, 
uh, as we close, and I want to invite you to pray with me. But let me just share with you two prayer points to kind of give you a sense of how I'm preparing my heart for this week of prayer. Um, I'm really asking God, number one, to help me to pray with faith. Uh, and, and that's what I want us to do. Uh, let me just share with you a passage of scripture. First John chapter 5, verse 14 says, this is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. He will hear your prayers as you lift up your names. Uh, and some of you may not have your name yet, but as, as, as you lift up your prayer requests before the Lord, I believe he will hear you and he will hear those names. How powerful is that, that God himself will hear those names that you call out? Uh, I believe that God will accomplish his work uh, in those that we are ministering to. And this is the kind of confidence that I want us to have uh, as we enter into this week. Our second prayer point, I, I'm really asking God uh, to help me to pray with humility, help me to pray with humility. Um, as God's people, we need to pray with a spirit of dependence. Church, prayer is the work. It is the work. It's not just something we do before we go into the work of God, but it's something that we do as we do the work of God. It is the work. It will guide us. It will sustain us. And your prayers will begin the ministry that God will lead you to. I believe that. I truly, truly believe that. The Holy Spirit wants to guide you before you go, and he wants to guide you as you go as well. I want to share with you Exodus chapter 33, verses 15 through 16. And uh, you, you might remember this from a couple of weeks back. Uh, this is Moses. And he says to the Lord, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? What will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? This is the spirit that I would love for us to approach God with, to say, I, I, I can't do this without you. Travis talked about that a little bit. I, I, I don't want to do this without you. I need your presence with me, regardless of, of who uh, I'm called to reach out to. Uh, I need your presence. And this is the kind of humility and dependence that I would love for us to approach this week with. So here's what I wanna do, church. I want us to pray together as a church, just to prepare our hearts. And I would love to see the Sundays, our Sundays together as sort of a huddle, the huddle before the break and before we actually execute the play, old football terminology. But I, I want us to see Sundays in that way because it's an, a unique opportunity to be equipped, uh, to be empowered and to be sent out. And so right now, if, if we can just prepare our hearts uh, for the week, let's pray together. I wanna invite you, uh, just to stretch out your arms, uh, to, to stretch out your hands as a sign, as a posture of humility to say, God, I'm, I need you right now. I need you in this week of prayer because I believe that prayer is the ministry and I believe that you have something amazing in store, not just for me, but for the people that, that I'm gonna be reaching out to. So just in a, in a spirit of humility, I want us to just reach out our hands. And if you, if you have four people already, I want you to just begin calling out their names and saying their names out loud. And so I want us to pray all out loud together. And as we close that out, I uh, want us to uh, close in prayer here. So let's go to the Lord in prayer uh, as we lift up our hearts, asking God to help us to pray in faith and pray in humility. So let's pray together.
Lord, see your people coming to you in humility. Lord, we believe that prayer is the work. Uh, And as we are praying, Lord, you have already gone out. You have already gone before us to prepare the work for us. And we believe, God, the words of 1 Thessalonians 5.24 that says that, Lord, that you are faithful to do the work, God, that you've called us to and you will do it. Lord, that's the kind of faith we have, Lord, in you as we approach this week of prayer. And as we pray throughout this week, Lord, give us faith. Give us humility. Give us wisdom to know how to pray, God, to how to lift up the people that you've placed in our hearts. And if we don't have people right now, God, I do pray that you would begin placing people's names in our hearts. Prepare our hearts for the work of prayer. For we believe in its power and its strength. So continue to do your work. Send us out. Help us to leave empowered and confident in your work. We love you, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.